In this week's episode, I'm talking to Asaf Jaffe from Israel about how he got into sourcing, hiring on five continents, and how to source in Israel. Welcome to episode 35 of the Sourcing Challenge Show. I'm your host, Mark Lundgren. I started off by asking Asaf how he got into sourcing. So, um, you know, basically, you know, how did I get started with sourcing? I guess, you know, it flows in my blood, basically. Um, you know, I can take you back to like uh, age, age 13, 14, <laughs> you know, when the whole MP3 scene exploded. Oh, yeah. No, now I'm talking, I'm talking about 96, 97. Okay? That's, when, that's so, when I got started with my first computer and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Back <laughs> then, you know, I, I was and still am a, a music fanatic. And I really, you know, got addicted to actually finding, you know, and collecting songs on my computer. I thought it was great. You know, instead of buying those horribly expensive CDs, you know, I can find my favorite songs and play them and make playlists, you know, and, you know, not, not wait for MTV to curate the music <laughs> for me. And back then it was not like, you know, just typing a song, getting to torrents or, or it, we talked about even pre-Napster days, you know. And this was like searching in FTP search sites and, and stuff like that. And this was like my first foray into sourcing and even Boolean search, by the mm. way. And, and because I was searching for very specific stuff. And um, so that these were the first days that kind of, you know, got the sourcing bug in my head. And uh, but I uh, really started doing this seriously uh, about eight, eight years back okay. in 2011. Um, in my previous employer, um, uh, um, it's a global executive search firm mm -hmm. called Nisha Global, mm -hmm. in which I've been working for uh, eight years in total. And um, this was a chance for me. And we're talking now we're uh, like fast forwarding into uh, about uh, 2011 to start really doing sourcing and uh, recruiting as well um, as as uh, an executive search consultant. Yeah. And what was very interesting about it was that the premise of Nisha Global was, and I think still is something that's pretty rare in, in the field of executive search firms. Why? Um, mainly because you find, if you look for executive search firms nowadays, they grow around certain, uh, let's say geographies, for yeah. example. Executive search firms in the Bay Area. Mm or executive search firms like all around Europe, let's say. Mm. On, on, an, on another hand, executive search firms grow around certain industries. Yeah. Okay, like if it's in the Bay Area, it, Bay Area, it's the tech scene. If it's like, let's say in the Wall Street area, it's around the financial services area. Okay, and um, what Nisha Global did, it came from a very unique premise. Um, basically, um, what it was offering and still offers is um, offering Israeli firms the chance to find for them um, foreign talent abroad. Mm -hmm. Israel is an island economy. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and it's also a very small economy. So a lot of the technology firms, but not only, not only high tech, but also low tech. Yeah. Um, they pretty much, if they want to grow, um, they very quickly outgrow the local market. And if they look for, you know, other areas to grow into, they go abroad. Yeah, and it's part of let's say uh, the Israeli um, entrepreneurship um, spirit is to you know to find business wherever they can find all over the globe, and not just go to specific markets. So, um, you know, when you when you do this, when you start marketing or or selling your stuff in other parts of the world, you know, you can relocate people from Israel to other parts of the world, but it's not guaranteed that they'll do good business. No, um, vice versa uh, sometimes. And many companies realize that they need to hire locals in the markets that they would like to enter. So um, basically that dictated um, that the requisitions that we're working on are highly flexible on three main aspects. The first one naturally is geography. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm proud to say that I've placed on five continents. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, the second thing is industry. A lot of what Israel has to offer to the world is tech, okay? Mm. But it can be software, it can be hardware, it can be financial services, it can also be low-tech, like cosmetics, for example. Mm. And I've been all around those industries. And the third thing is the scope of uh, roles that we were sourcing for. I mean, a lot of them were sales and marketing roles in different types of seniorities. 
Mm -hmm. um, and some of them were engineering roles or financial analysis roles. Yeah. Some of them were also VP level or even C-level executives. So I've been doing all of that. Mm. Every new rec that I, that I would have gotten is like, where do I begin in terms of uh, <laughs> industry, target, geography, and what's this role about? And each time it's, it's like, you know, the, they throw you off a flying plane and, you know, while you're between, uh, while you're in midair, you have to kind of calculate what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you land on the ground with your parachute, you need to start running yeah. quickly. Okay. Why? Because we were competing naturally with local firms. Okay. So that led to uh, what, what I can describe as very agile type mm -hmm. of attitude. It was like, you know, throw everything at me. I'm capable of doing that. Yeah. And that pretty much corresponded, you know, also with the period. It was 2011, and um, LinkedIn began to reach really a critical mass, not only in the U.S. or not only in, in like, first world economies, but also in, in developing countries, specifically the BRICS countries. Um, and Israel is doing a lot of business there. Uh, Brazil, Russia, uh, Indonesia, China, uh, and South Africa. All those, by the way, um, countries in which I've placed people. Mm. And um, basically it was because, you know, we started like this and information was pretty much in the, in the palms of our hands. We just needed to make sense out of it. Mm. Um, and we, we have become very agile in terms of, you know, starting a rec, let's, let's research. But it, it's not, it was not necessarily to do like a really deep research. Mm. I call it like a journalist level research. Yeah. Okay. Research it to a level that you can write like, you know, um, like a, a piece of 500 words about this industry, who's against who, okay? Identify the key players, understand what's the typical, you know, um, uh, career paths in this field and, and get a go at it and start approaching people and talk to people. In the end of the day, you know, whatever research you do based on reading stuff is incomparable with the information that you gather through actually speaking with industry insiders, yes. candidates prospects for that matter so um so yeah that was um what i was doing in uh, nisha global for the past seven years and uh it's been a very fun roller coaster to ride um there was no two two days that that were similar i can imagine yeah and um and it's a roller coaster because you know it takes you to places that you can never imagine and Things go up, things go down. It's like, you know, in, I guess in a lot of business, especially in, in executive search, are, are going at a pace like that. And uh, recently I made a, made a change. Um, after, after seven, eight years of doing that, I decided that, um, first of all, I want to go corporate. And secondly, I want to focus more on technical talent. Mm -hmm. And that had led me to a very different place. Uh, I'm, I'm working today as a talent acquisition specialist in Intuit, mm -hmm. which is uh, a global uh, software company dedicated to uh, providing financial software yeah. to uh, small businesses and individuals, and uh, mainly recruiting in Israel and mainly recruiting tech talent. Uh, but for me, you know, when it, from the mindset perspective, this was like, you know, I'm just um, taking another rec now or another realm now. And I'm diving in, in, into this world and I'm learning who again, who's against who. But uh, the main difference is that now I have the power of a company behind me. Yeah. That means that, you know, from a talent marketing perspective, um, I'm, rep I'm coming already with like um, a brand behind me, um, which is different. And I wanted to experience that. It's a, I think it's a certain uh, form of strength in terms of sourcing efforts. Because it's one thing to be what I did before, which was like coming from a stance where I'm the complete unknown. I mean, think about it. I was approaching people all over the world. Okay. My name, well, the name of my company is virtually unknown. We're a seven people company coming from Israel. Okay. And most cases, they, they weren't even uh, able to pronounce my name. Okay, or to make sense out of, of a written name that they gotten an email from or a LinkedIn message from or, or a text message from. So th this is a large barrier to overcome. And, um, and now I'm like in a totally different place. You know, the name Intuit behind me is kind of, you know, a, a better door opener for that matter. 
and um, and I already see it that it, it enables me to kind of um, attract um, more people mm -hmm. and uh, make a better selection out of a better sorting space mm -hmm. for talent so you're still looking for people then globally to come to Israel or is it a bit of mix between finding local talent for into it and finding international talent to get to uh, to to Israel yeah so right now it's a hundred percent local talent okay. in Israel right now what's been like in your experience kind of working in yeah every yeah every pretty the, the big countries what's been the hardest country to recruit in or to, to source in yeah um, I would say in, in a few aspects um, Japan mm -hmm. very difficult very difficult um, may, there's a language barrier even if you source in international companies yeah you you come across it um, and there's also like the loyalty barrier mm. um, in Japan it's a it's a wild generalization of course but you know um, there, there's even a term called salary man yeah. we, and um, Japanese are typically very loyal to their employer and won't be too eager to even explore um, new opportunities while they're employed unless something really bad happens <laughs> um, so that's one um, second thing that second country that was difficult could be uh, Germany mm -hmm. um, where uh, also um, especially in, in, in tech Mm -hmm. Many people are not are not too eager to speak to a headhunter, mm -hmm. executive search consultant, um, and also and also by the way, uh, thing that I found there is the fact that in certain areas, let's say for example, um, broadly speaking, software developers, mm -hmm. um, the economy, the the labor economy in Germany has been uh, gradually moving towards um, a gig economy. Yeah, many people are working as as um, as uh, independent contractors and like switching projects like once every year. And you know, when you're approaching them and telling them, you know, I have an offer for you to be a full time employee, they say, no, thanks. You know, I'm a contractor. I'm not going to you know lend myself to a company for for any full time thing. Mm. When when you kind of started out um, with sourcing, and where where did you go to kind of learn and get tips and tricks, and or was it very much trial and error? A lot of trial and error, a lot of it, um, especially in the first year. Um, <laughs> luckily, we were very small back then, so I had room for you know making errors and not like you know screwing up the business completely. Um, so I guess the first I can tell you about the first epiphany that I had was when I when I've come across um, uh, Glenn Cathy's blog, Bullion mm -hmm. Black Belt. I guess this was like sometime sometime in 2011. Um, it was late at night, and I stayed up at night until 3 p.m. <laughs> until 3 a.m. Sorry, just scrolling back, reading and reading, and, and taking notes and sending stuff to myself. <laughs> and that was a true epiphany for me. Yeah. It was like you know everything. He like touched every pain point that I had in terms of, of sourcing and technical sourcing, and um, you know how can I not just um, not just in how to source and or let's say, how to build Boolean strings or how to understand Boolean concepts better in order to find, uh, to kind of enlarge um, your, the net that you're casting, um, but also the concept of high-hanging fruit. Yeah. Um, which for me was a real, real epiphany. Why? Because understanding that, you know, I'm operating in a field where uh, candidates and top candidates get, get bombarded with yeah. offers like, you know, every day, every week, and I need to stand out, and I know how to stand out. I know how to write a good, compelling uh, approach message. I know how to do it, but how can I stand out? Yeah. And how do I get to the people who do not get like bombarded with a lot of messages? And the whole concept of skeletal profiles, people who have LinkedIn profiles, um, but who contain very, very um, you know, limited information about themselves. How to how to take all the information that I understand that I need and kind of really reduce it to the bare minimum, to the bare essentials and understand what are indications. Yeah. Okay. Because um, the way that, the way that I've been working and I still work is basically, if you can think about it, you know, you, you get a bucket list of, of skills um, from a hiring manager, let's say. Okay. 
and um, and you also want the, this person to be successful. Now, a wild generalization. Again, I'm talk, I'll be throwing out <laughs> a lot of generalizations today, but you need to do it because it's in my in my opinion, it's it's better to 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 cast a very wide net and then sift through the false positives, then cast it in a net which is too narrow, and then you never know where you didn't look to find, you know, relevant people. So if you come to think about it, you know, successful companies rely on successful, successful people. Mm. Okay. So therefore, if you understand which companies are the most successful in a specific field, okay, map them and find the people who work for those companies. Okay. Now I'm sure I'm not saying that, you know, everyone at a successful company is, is a successful person. Mm. I'm not saying that, but if I make sure to map every single person at a successful company, approach them, and we know the funnel, not everyone is going to answer you, right? But if you, you know, get in touch with them and, and start speaking with them, you actually maximize the likelihood of, you know, finding this rare gem who's mm. responsible for, you know, for the success of, of his or her company. Moreover, um, so, so that, that told me, that it's not always, even though it's like very, um, you know, uh, it's very easy to just throw the bucket list onto a, a search engine like LinkedIn, for example, and find all the people that have all those keywords. It's good to like, you know, step outside the box for a moment and say, I'm not going to use any skills, mm. any skills, but I know companies who are successful. Mm -hmm. in su we have successful people working in successful companies. If a person has a profile, and all the information that I know about this person is which role um, is he or she uh, taking at that company, and that's it. And I don't even know for how long they've been working in that company. That's enough for mm -hmm. me. That's enough. Okay, I can get I can get a false positive, no doubt. But this can be, you know, if I if I don't approach this person, this will be a you know could be a false negative. Mm -hmm. Plus, this person is hard to find. Yeah. So this person perhaps is not bombarded every day with offers from executive search consultants or recruiters. And therefore, they might be more, um, you know, receptive of my message. They might be less biased against recruiters yeah. or sources. So this actually uh, really helped me to find those rare gems, those high-hanging fruit, those uh, people who um, are like, you know, deeply not looking for a job. I, I can even say more. I can even say that, you know, it's those people who maintain a very uh, skeletal LinkedIn profile. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Could be, could be many reasons, but one reason could be that they don't have time for maintaining a social presence. You know why? Because they're too busy, you know, on okay. do, working exactly, yeah. doing, doing stuff for, for their success and for the success of their employer. So yeah. those are the people that I want to target. What's um, some of the tools that you normally use or that, that you did use um, to... Still use. Well, both, yeah, still use to get you know, deeper information and, and to find more out about people. In Nisha Global, because it was you know, such a wide, uh, you know, wide variety of recs, you need, you need to kind of focus yourself. Um, so we use LinkedIn as, mm -hmm. a, as a primary um, database of information most of the time. When it came to uh, Germany, we also used Xing. Yeah. Um, and um, on top of LinkedIn, we used a multitude of extensions that could help us, you know, to get additional information. So one, one category was um, the, uh, those extensions that give you private emails or mm -hmm. phone numbers of candidates in order to, um, you know, approach them, uh, you know, in a way that they wouldn't expect. Mm -hmm. Um, another category was, um, uh, an extension or a platform that I discovered very, very early on, uh, in, in their formation and I, and I became a strong advocate of theirs and they're called Hello Talent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a company which is based in France and they've created something which I've been yearning to get, um, <laughs> when I, when I just found out about the products, um, I was, and I think many sourcers or recruiters still use like, you know, Excel sheets for maintaining uh, their data about, about, you know, the project. And that, that was like pre, pre LinkedIn recruiter for me anyway. Now, so, you know, no true, I didn't use a true CRM, just Excel mm. sheets. Yeah. And, and the killer feature 
of Hello Talent was we offer you a Chrome extension with with two or three clicks you're adding um, a profile you know to to a project to a CRM system and you can you know play with it play with it, with these records and change everything and tag them you know s- semantic tagging I think is it's it's a su- such a great feature yeah. for me at least um, in order to you know kind of you know get a get a hold of the information and 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 make sense out of it because you know you can approach uh, dozens or, or uh, people a day of or hundreds hundreds of people a week and you need to make sense out of it yeah. and hello talent helped me a great great deal um, and um, I also became kind of friends with their uh, chief product officer and I helped them you know with a lot of inputs along the way in order mm-hmm. to improve their product and um, I still think it's a great piece of software and this is something that can be helpful to um, a lot of recruiters and, and a lot of sourcers in their work. It's also, agile, it's yeah. friendly. Also just sharing the projects with the managers and saying, look, this is, this is the people I have in your project. Have a look at them. You know, let me know what you think. Similar to what a lot of people do with LinkedIn recruiter, but without having to have a LinkedIn recruiter seat to put that in the project. Um, and it's not necessarily always only people from LinkedIn, just putting other people in from other you know, social sites, but it's all in one project and you can kind of collect them there. Yeah, the, I guess the major uh, advantage of Hello Talent is the fact that it offers um, a collaboration platform. Yeah. Whereas if you share information with the hiring manager via LinkedIn recruiter, it's almost like one way. You're sending yeah. them profiles for feedback and that's it. And they don't even have access for this afterwards. Yeah. And, and the Hello Talent is more like, you know, a shared canvas. Yeah where everyone can collaborate, it, it records uh, all feedback and they and hiring managers can log in and check out what's, what's, been, what's been going on since yeah. the last time and stuff like that. So it's very efficient. Yeah. That's why I like it. For, so there's more and more kind of companies that either normally buy a company in Israel and have to recruit there, um, or they already have kind of operations in Israel, and, but the recruiters doing that is either in, in Europe or in North America. And it's, for us, it's always... If you don't know what the difference is, it's hard to kind of put in, uh, you know, to the mindset. What's, how do you go about differently from an Einstein point of view when you have to recruit locally in Israel? Okay, so first of all, I'm going to focus right now on, on, on the tech field, mm-hmm. okay? Um, and uh, in the tech field, you know, I guess you should differentiate between, uh, like, again, very generally between two populations. One is, let's say, uh, the technical talent, developers, scientists um, on one hand and on the other hand to put let's say people who are more um, sales and marketing oriented okay um, generally speaking um, Israelis um, the Israeli society is characterized with a um, uh, uh, much lower level of, of uh, formality mm. okay so um, I would never approach someone in Israel with like, you know, dear first name, <laughs> you know, dear Mark. That, that's like, you know, like signaling, hey, I, I'm an alien here, <laughs> you know. And, um, and basically uh, what I like um, when approaching people, more generally speaking, um, is, is approaching them with an invitation for a conversation. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm not wasting your time. Here I am, human being like you, okay? I don't bite. And, um, and let's talk. Let's mm. have a conversation. Many Israelis, I think, um, you know, we, like we talked, like we said in the beginning of the conversation, you know, many Israelis look up to, you know, working for a company which, uh, which is a company uh, which is based outside of Israel. Mm. It's, it's, as if, it's as if many Israelis, you know, um, feel that um, it's their chance to really, uh, you know, get into a company which offers, let's say, higher standards. Mm. Okay, global company, higher standards, um, chance to, uh, let's say, be promoted, and um, so, so this is how many Israelis look at it. Okay, um, it will, it will be far easier, I would say. Um, to to kind of you know approach people who are into sales and marketing and stuff like that who already know their competition, mm-hmm. so they're more informed of what's going on you know in their industry and and hence 
they'll be more open for discussions. Mm -hmm. And um, when it comes to the tech talent, the engineers, the scientists, um, it's going to be it's going to be more difficult. It's going to be less, you know, the the allure of of a foreign company, and more of more of you know what's in it for me, technology, yeah, and um, and you know how I can and as opposed to what I have today, how this takes me forward in you know my road to satisfaction at work, or I would even venture to say self fulfillment, yeah. uh, professionally of course. And, and this is, I, I guess, this is something that, you know, when approaching uh, Israeli tech talent, I would, I would advise people to put in front. Mm. There is the, um, there's the famous um, um, uh, what, how, and why uh, circle about, you know, the mission statement of a company. So, you know, the why should really receive the prominence here, okay, before, before the how and the what in order to kind of, you know, get uh, uh, someone to, to, grasp, to grasp someone's interest and, um, and moving forward to, to a deeper discussion. Connecting with people in English, it shouldn't be a big problem. Like you wouldn't, if you could, would you rather do it in Hebrew or is English fine? Yeah. So look, for me, it's not a problem because I master <laughs> both languages, right? <laughs> um, look, basic... So here's, here's another thing that I found out in my uh, five months uh, <laughs> in Intuit so far. Um, so I like to start approach, uh, approaching people with Hebrew, um, especially because, you know, they, they very quickly recognize me as an Israeli. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's going to be a kind of pretentious, I guess, to approach a fellow Israeli in English. And, and remember, I want to create a sense of familiarity. Yeah. I want to to kind of, you know, spark a uh, an informal conversation. That's my interest. Talk to me, you know, just talk to me. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to like, you know, throw all the information mm -hmm. at you for you to read. Let's just have a talk. Let's, have, let's, let's just have a quick talk. And, um, you know, I also believe in my convincing um, uh, abilities. Just getting someone to talk to me, this really, you know, solves a lot of the uh, suspicions and creates trust and creates better engagement. Um, but some people, um, I'm sure that you know that Israel is an immigrant society, and um, and uh, if I would like to generalize, first of all, you know a lot of people who uh, are part of the uh, technology industry, especially in in development and, and science roles, doesn't matter in which uh, seniority level, are people who uh, immigrated in the last. 20, 25 years or so. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there was a very large wave of immigration from Russia and uh, former Soviet rep republics starting the early 90s. Mm. So um, I actually found out that those people um, um, actually have a tendency to, uh, even when I start approaching them in Hebrew, they quickly move to English. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay, so, you know, for me, it's not a problem. And, uh, but it's, you know, you need to recognize who those people are. Sometimes they, they, you know, if you're not an Israeli, it's going to be difficult for you to have this, you know, special sense of is, is this name a Hebrew name or is this, does this person name imply that, you know, they, uh, I mean, you know, first name, last name or, or mm. whatever imply different nationality. Yeah. Um, but for someone who, who is, uh, you know, a natural Israeli, an Israeli, uh, born and bred, it will, it will, you know, this will be much more intuitive. Yeah. What's something exciting that you, uh, you're working on now, other than kind of getting your feet in, in, into it? So, um, so right now, um, I guess, you know, the most exciting thing that, that Intuit is working on right now is actually building a very, very strong um, uh, powerhouse um, in, in data science. Mm -hmm. And Intuit has recognized that, um, Intuit, by the way, it's, it, it's a predominantly American company. Yeah, most of its most of its R and D um, is based in uh, in the United States, and they recognized Israel as a center of excellence for artificial intelligence and machine learning mm -hmm. uh, knowledge. And therefore, they decided to actually invest in uh, opening an in, in Israeli R and D site. And they're not very quick in you know just you know offshoring everywhere. It's the U.S. Um, there's also an R and D site in India, and there's Israel. And there's also a small R&D site in, in Edmonton, Canada. That's mm -hmm. it. So the majority is still in the U.S. 
but they recognize that Israel can be a, you know, a very strong potential for data science talent, and we're growing it, and I have a, a very uh, important uh, uh, participation in it uh, mm -hmm. nowadays. Um, Intuit is also a company that, um, like many other companies, put diversity as a, as a leading flag, and um, we're uh, actually investing, and we have the resources for it, a lot in creating a um, higher level of diversity in the company, specifically within data science. Um, that, that means mostly gender diversity. And Intuit took sponsorship um, uh, this year of an event called Women in Data Science, mm -hmm. um, which is a brand that operates in the US, and we held uh, its uh, first instance uh, in Israel this year, cool. and this, uh, and we're kind of you know taking the lead of actually um, driving driving it forward and um, and trying to uh, you know be uh, an attractive place for uh, for women data scientists to um, uh, to join and um, and to make very interesting research. Yeah. Asaf, if uh, people want to stay in touch with you and see you know where the kind of things that you're working on and, and things like that, how do they best do that? Well, um, they can go to my social cha uh, channels. Uh, I post, um, I post everything on, on my Twitter, mm -hmm. um, which, uh, which is Asaf 4747 <laughs> and, um, 4747 was my, uh, first phone extension <laughs> at my first employer. So I figured out that I got such a, such a cool extension. I should you know, <laughs> carry on with it. Use it. Yeah. Um, so my Twitter and also my uh, Facebook page and my LinkedIn page. Mm -hmm. I, find it, I find it difficult to kind of, I don't know if, uh, if at all people monitor their uh, LinkedIn feed. Mm -hmm. I have like, you know, um, thousands of people in my LinkedIn network. So, you know, going through the LinkedIn feed is, is an mission impossible. But um, uh, I find Twitter to be, I guess, you know, the most convenient of them all uh, because it's focused and, um, and I, maintain, I maintain two Twitter accounts. It makes it easy, easier for me to, because I have like one personal Twitter, which I use for stuff that interests me outside of work. And I have a professional Twitter. And in my professional Twitter, I can follow, you know, the people who are related to the stuff I do at work um, and post stuff that are work related. And because Twitter, let's face it, Twitter has a lot of like, you know, internal jokes and stuff like that. And, and it can be also a very serious form of like sharing information, uh, uh, serious medium for sharing information. So I chose to kind of separate those and it also helps me to focus. Mm. So if I'm, on, if I'm on in the mood right now to find out like professional stuff, I go to my professional Twitter. If I'm right now, you know, it's late evening and I'm tired and I just want to entertain myself, go to my personal Twitter, that's it. Look, thank you very much uh, for your time. And uh, yeah, I look forward to, to, to meeting you as well. Okay, excellent. I mean, um, uh, yeah, we'll see if I have any chances to, um, you know, uh, also maybe, travel. Uh, maybe travel SourceCon well. in May in Amsterdam. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? Nothing planned, but who knows? No. Talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.